Well, welcome again to our Tuesday night family Bible study, and uh, it's an honor to be able to present the Word of God to you and share, I believe, some things that the Lord has put in my heart to share with you. So, and I want to especially want to welcome the Abounding Grace Church family, and then of course all of our guests and others uh, around the world that have been watching. And so we want to say thank you for being a part of this and making it possible and a success. Amen. Of course, as we've already stated, everything uh, since COVID-19 and quarantines and shelter in place and uh, people streaming. So, but I thank you for being a part of this and opening up your homes and uh, your hearts and uh, hopefully your spirits to the Word of God. There's nothing like Bible study. I mean, uh, I enjoy preaching and have always, I'm probably more of an evangelist than anything else, but uh, I also understand that the Word of God says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And uh, sometimes we may think that, uh, you know, Bible study is a little on the boring side and we want a lot of inspiration and, and emotionalism to it. But, you know, again, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So every once in a while it's just good to sit down, slow down, and open the Word of God and talk uh, about the things of God. And so hopefully that's what we'll be able to do tonight. Amen. Uh, I want to remind you of our announcements. Amen. Of course, if you're interested in a Zoom group, and we are going to try to continue a lot of these Zoom groups even after we go uh, back into the sanctuary. And uh, But I want to remind you of those Zoom groups. You can go to agn.church, and it's on there. And if you want to join, then we encourage you to do so. And then, of course, our giving online. I want to say thank you to everyone who's been faithful, and I appreciate your faithfulness during this trying time. And uh, But uh, it teaches us and shows us that the people of God put God first. And I want to say thank you to all those who have been supporting. So, again, if you want to give or support, then go to agn.church, and there's a link there where you can uh, give, and we encourage you to do so. And at the same time, thank you for all those who have been faithfully supporting and giving. And uh, I, I pray that God's blessing will rest upon you. Amen. Well, the, the main question is, when are we going to be allowed to go back into the sanctuary and back into the building? So we're working as hard as we can. And uh, the city, the mayor, has asked that congregations not assemble uh, until the, after the 15th of June, so that's on a Monday. So we're trying to work to where if we can get the Church of Christ to sign off to where maybe we'll go ahead and have service on the 14th. And uh, I, I don't think that would get us in trouble, but we'll see. We're, we're, we, wanna, we don't want to do anything that would cause us to be in conflict with the city or create problems for us amen but if not it doesn't matter if we don't then on that monday the 15th uh, we're planning on uh, monday evening having a prayer meeting and uh and coming back together kind of a church service prayer slash worship get acquainted get reacquainted uh mask to mask amen so anyway we are going to go back and we're going to make sure that the building is sanitized and uh, we make sure that uh, we prepare it and so there'll be some things that we're going to be required to do and of course uh, sanitizing hand sanitizer mask checking for temperatures all that will be done and so i'm just letting all the abounding grace people know that we are going to put those things in place so when you come into the building it will be a little different and uh, you won't be able to congregate out in the foyer or stand out so you'll have to come in and kind of keep a little distance and we'll have people spaced out and the ushers will know what to do and uh, we'll make sure that we follow the guidelines amen of course i am having just a little trouble uh you know the social distancing and then watching all the protests that are going on and there is no social distancing there and some of it seems to be condoned and so uh you know it is what it is so but we want to we want to make sure that we stay scripturally sound. So, uh, but those are thoughts and things that do enter your mind. You wonder, you know, why is this allowed? And and uh, you know, then churches can't congregate. You can't have no more than a hundred at a time. But yet, thousands of people are filling the streets shoulder to shoulder. So, uh, anyway, uh, 
that's for greater minds than mine to figure out. And uh, God is a God that guards justice, and he understands those things. So we'll let him deal with it. Amen. All right. God bless you in the name of the Lord. And uh, those those are the announcements. Also, our, age, our kids' ministries, I do want to remind you of that still going on. And uh, so... When school gonna start back up? Nobody knows for sure. Everything's still pretty fluid, but uh, I do think that we will get back to some sort of similitude of normal. It will never be normal as we know it, but yet I think that we will get back to some things. Amen. Now, hopefully, not complacency and spiritual laziness or whatever, but we'll continue to be fervent and continue to move forward. Amen. All right. God bless you in the name of the Lord, and uh, we are thankful for the Word of God. Amen. And uh, the Word of God guides us. It protects us. It's a, it's a sword. It's a, the only thing that the Bible talks about is in the weapons when we were told to put on the whole armor of God. All the other things are for defense and to protect us, but the Bible talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is our weapon, which is the Word of God. So we're thankful for the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Amen. All right, I want to read to you tonight from Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15. Now, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I was uh, in a Zoom meeting, and I'll refer back to it here a little bit with uh, what we call the Bishop's Network, people that uh, looked to us for, as a pastor or, or elder in their life. And we was talking the other day, kind of got into this. And uh, so I, I, I made a mental note that I wanted to talk about this and to deal with it. And uh, so then I just kind of pushed it back a little bit. And then I was studying and I was preparing to teach from Proverbs chapter 2. When I got down to the last verse, it talks about uh, rooting out, pulling out, and it brought me back to this, and I knew immediately that this was something that we, I needed to share with you and something that I needed to talk to you about. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Notice what he said, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Amen. And then I want to go to John chapter 20 and verse number 15. And uh, familiar text of Scripture to those that have been around the Bible for a while, and especially those that have attended any kind of an Easter service. Amen. John 20 and 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him. Now watch what, she, what the Scripture says. She supposing him to be the gardener said unto him, Sir... If thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Just the gardener, tell me where he's at. And if you've taken him, you've put him somewhere, I'll, I'll take care of it from there. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. So immediately when he called her name, she knew that this is the master, this is Rabboni. Amen. I, I want to talk to you tonight uh, on this subject. The gardener is back. The gardener is back. Amen. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to teach your word. God, I'm so thankful that you've included me and called me into the ministry to share your word. Thankful for the insights and the things that you reveal to us that we can share with your people. And I pray tonight, God, that would happen. Give us revelation. Let revelation and illumination come into our spirits and into our minds. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And let there be a flow of the word and of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you in the name of the Lord. Uh, I want to kind of go back here to Genesis and uh, kind of lay in a foundation. Amen. Now, there's a lot about the Genesis account that uh, a lot of opinions, a lot of theories out there. Uh, different things, amen. And uh, I don't want to—I don't want to say something that's false or you know something that may be erroneous. But uh, I think that there's a lot about it that we've kind of uh, maybe overlooked or perhaps seen it in a little different light. And one of the examples that I would give you of that is—is is the serpent there on the tree. <clears throat> 
And uh, most people in any painting that you see or the way that it's presented, of course, <coughs> is by some snake hanging in this tree and this snake and this woman's having a conversation. Uh, I remember reading uh, a few years ago that a lot of the Jewish tradition was it was not it was not an actual snake because if you go on the Bible says that it was cursed and God said on your belly you're going to go and you're going to eat dirt here after so uh, you know you can Google this and of course you can trust Google but you can Google this and you can ask, try to find out if there's any snake anywhere that eats dirt or whatever and of course the answer is no and so you know what actually happened what was the serpent what was the curse now personally I believe as this Jewish tradition kind of taught me is is that the serpent was uh, an angel of light when Paul's talking to the Corinthians he makes statement he says we have not come in cunning craftiness and one translation says we did not come to you like a serpent or the serpent in the garden. So in other words, when it talks about he was more cunning, it means he come to them with uh, being able to uh, deceive and crafty and twisting things. And so uh, when it talks about the serpent, I think it's talking about the nature in which he came. And so that that's a little insight there. And of course, uh, dirt that you're going to eat is, I believe, that... Uh, Humanity is made out of dirt, and so this angel of light you will consume, you will work through their flesh. And so that's my own personal belief of it. So, But when you go back a little bit here, of course, uh, God has created the heaven and the earth, and everything is created. God causes, uh, you know, he, he creates this garden, uh, this place called Eden, the garden of God. And there uh, in our text, he places Adam. He creates Adam, and he, he puts Adam in the garden, and he tells them, according to the text, he tells him, now it's your job to tend and to keep this garden. Uh, I want you to tend it, and I want you to keep it. Uh, it's amazing that when you use those terms, it actually would mean to guard or to protect. I want you to guard and to protect this garden, and I want you to make sure that there's nothing that comes in this garden that shouldn't be here. It's your responsibility to tend it. So uh, it would be easy to say at that particular time that Adam become a gardener. Amen. God put him in the garden and said, this is your responsibility. I want you to make sure that the garden is what it ought to be. I want you to protect it. I want you to keep it. And uh, you are the gardener, so make sure that you take care of it exactly as it's needed to be taken care of. Now, there's a lot of other things that are mentioned and, and given here. Uh, also, I think that Adam would be correct in uh, for us to say that God had given Adam tremendous dominion and authority. When Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted and uh, Satan said all these things, have been given to me, and I can give them to whomever I want to give them to. Of course, he was offering all this glory and power to Jesus if he had bowed and worshiped him. And so I think when you get into that, uh, of course, what he was actually saying is, is uh, dominion and power was transferred to me. It was given to me, and I've had it, and I can give it to whoever I want to give it to. And I think that's proven. I think that, first of all, uh, I, I don't think that Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. In the curse there in the garden, he was told that the heel of the woman will crush your head. And so I think that he was always looking for the heel, the head crusher. I think he was always looking for the heel that would crush him. He was always in search of the man that would have this, this Messiah that would come. And so I think that there in the Old Testament were examples to where uh, he went to people that he thought had the potential of this. He wasn't quite sure and had the potential of this. And I think he offered them the same thing that he offered to Jesus. And one of the reasons why I say that is when you get over into the book of Ezekiel, it starts talking about the anointed cherub, and then it comes on down through there, and then it talks about the king of what is a Tyre and Sidon and all this and how that you were anointed and beautiful and all this. So I think it was literally starting out about talking about an actual king, but then it morphs over to men who Satan offered to give them this tremendous authority and this tremendous power, and they took it. They actually took it, and uh, it's almost like they become a form of some sort of a 
antichrist or a false messiah. He just wanted to make sure if I can get you to uh, submit and if I can get you to rebel against the word of God, if I can get you out of your place, basically, then you'll be no threat to me. Of course, these men accepted it, but when they come to Jesus, he offered him the same thing. Look, if you'll just bow and worship me. All this power and glory that I just showed you of all these kingdoms, I'll give it to you. It's yours. And of course, Jesus understanding, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to accept it. So there was tremendous authority and there was tremendous dominion that was given to Adam, but there was also tremendous responsibility. You are to protect. You are to guard this garden. You are the gardener. It's up to you to make sure that there's not things planted or growing or whatever in here that should not be here. Of course, I think that Adam failed the test when he allowed the serpent and was not there to protect the woman. And I don't want to get into all that. That's a whole other subject. But here it is. Now, all of a sudden, Adam, when he falls into sin, when he rebels against the word of God, he is now expelled from the garden. He's expelled from the garden. Now, I want to be careful how I go into this because uh, some could misunderstand it. Amen. But Jesus, or God spoke very specifically and put an angel there with a, with a flaming sword and said, I got to keep him out. I got to keep man out lest he go to the tree of life and live forever. Now, uh, I'm sure there may be other explanations, but the one that I see is, is that, you know what, I've got to deal with the sin problem before I can let people back to the tree of life or before I can let them back into the garden. Uh, I still think that God has a garden. According to that text, God still has a garden. And there was an angel with the flaming sword that was keeping the way, keeping the way, saying, you know what, until sin is dealt with, until God's judgment is meted out, then man cannot come back in here and we're, Adam is not allowed back into this garden until some things are dealt with. Amen. And so I, I think there's a garden. I think the garden has been there. I think it's been kept. But now I want to go to 1 Corinthians, and we don't have to read it, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul, of course, is addressing the Corinthians, and he starts talking about this first Adam and how that he was earthy and, and, and how that uh, he was of the earth and all. But then he begins to talk about, uh, most people would refer to it as the second Adam, but actually it's referred to as the last Adam. So we have, we have the first Adam in the garden, and of course the rebellion, the fall of man, and now he's cast out of the garden, and there is a, an angel with the flaming sword there to keep it, lest man in his sinful state would get back to the tree of life and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Amen. Now, I, I, I want to tell you that I do believe the first Adam was expelled. The garden has been there, but now we have a last Adam. Now, this last Adam went through the temptation. He was there with Satan, just like over here with Eve and all this stuff. But now this last Adam, Jesus Christ, is also being tempted, but he did not allow the enemy to get him out of his place. He remained where he should, submitted to God and obedient to him. That's the reason why Jesus continue, continuously would say, I do what my father says. I only repeat what he tells me to say. On and on it goes. And he teaches us the power of submission and the power of being in alignment with God and his word. So now he goes to the cross. He's the word made flesh. He goes to the cross. He dies and is buried. Amen. Of course, here's the Easter story. He's buried. Now on the third day, of course, being resurrected, he comes out of the grave and Mary goes down. She's going down to anoint the body again and, and all this stuff. And when she gets there, she can't find him. And so she's seeing this man, begins this conversation and says, supposing him to be the gardener. It's amazing that this is the term that's used. Supposing him to be the gardener. And, he's, and she said, uh, hey, uh, first of all, he sees her weeping. And he asks her, why, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And, of course, then Jesus says, Mary. But notice, supposing him to be the gardener. Now, a lot of people say she made a mistake. Uh, this was Jesus, Rabboni, the master. But in reality, Mary, when she says that, she actually... Uh, 
although not aware of what she's saying, but she is speaking some profound truths and speaking some things that maybe we have overlooked. Amen. So now we have the first Adam, the gardener of the original garden, and he's expelled, kept out. But now here is the last Adam. And so everything that the first Adam lost, everything that the first Adam was expelled from, the last Adam redeemed it, brought us back to it. And so I believe personally that when Jesus Christ, uh, when he talked about uh, the thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. I really believe that in that garden of God that there is a tree of life. Now, the tree of life is spirit life, the fruit of it. When you partake of the fruit of it, it brings spirit life. And so I believe that when Jesus Christ died and as our high priest doing what he was necessary to accomplish as that great mediator and when he put the blood on the mercy seat and all this stuff and all, I believe when he dealt with the sin problem, that now he has access back into the garden and this, this state of man can eat from the tree of life. He's glorified. He's eternal now. <clears throat> and so the deal is, is back to the tree of life. Now man can go back to the tree and man can live in, not in a sinful state forever, but man can live in righteousness and he can live in uh, overcoming sin by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. Amen. And so now it's reality that this gardens over here, it has been protected. There is no way. But it's amazing to me that Jesus makes this statement. He said that he was to protect the way, to protect the way. And then Jesus' declaration when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now notice, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All this deals back to the garden. It deals back to the angel protecting the way. And of course, the way is truth, and truth is life. It brings you to life. So it brings you to the tree of life. And so now, instead of being expelled, the gardener left the garden through the first Adam, but now the gardener is back. And so the gardener, Jesus Christ, is back in the garden of God. There is now through him, Jesus said, I am the way. I am not a way. This is what separates Christianity. I understand that there's a lot of people that, you know, uh, in their reasoning and stuff and all, they want to say, look, you don't have a right to say that Christianity is the way and other religious groups don't have the right to do it. But what separates Christianity, of course, from that is Jesus did not say, I am a way. He said, I am the way and the way leads to truth and to life. So <clears throat> the deal is, is if that's the case, then Jesus Christ goes back into the garden. He makes a way for us to be able to get to the tree of life, which I believe is spirit life. And spirit life, I believe, is through the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwell in you, it shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Amen. So here's the deal. Uh, the gardener is back. Now, that ought to excite you. Matter of fact, you ought to kind of get up and take a little lap around your living room or, or uh, honk your horn or flash your lights or wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. Amen. And, of course, I watched a preacher the other night, and he was talking about now our cars are spiritual, and we're flashing our lights and honking the horn, making our cars spiritual. It don't have anything to do with your car. It has everything to do with with the fact of the understanding that the gardener is back. Jesus Christ, the last Adam, is back in the garden, and now the way is open. He made a way. No man cometh to the Father except the Spirit draw him. I'm making a way for you. I'm going before you so that you can get to the mercy seat. I'm going before you so that you can come back to the garden and you can live there. Now, if that's the case, this is where I want to go. If that's the case, then uh, it's important to understand just as Adam was to protect the garden, then Jesus Christ's responsibility is also to protect his garden and to protect this garden. Now, the gardener is back. The gardener is back. It's amazing to me how many terms and things that Jesus used to refer to sowing and planting and reaping and pruning and, and harvest and all these things, understanding things about gardening, things about planting, and so on and so forth. But there is something very important in one of the parables that Jesus gave, or one of the statements that he talked about. He's talked about this tree that was not producing fruit. 
and how that when that tree, because it was not producing fruit, that uh, he was going to cut it down. And so he says to the man, let's cut it down. Basically, he says to the gardener, let's cut it down. And the gardener asked, just give me one more year to dig around it. Give me one more year to prune around it. I, I, let, me, let me work with it. Let me, let me try to help it and give it another year to see if it's going to produce fruit. I see Jesus Christ in that. I see God's wrath or judgment saying, you know what? There's no fruit here. There's no fruit of righteousness. But Jesus Christ, of course, let me work with this. Let me, let me be the gardener. Let me do what I can do. And through the sacrifice that I'm going to make in order for this tree to produce fruit. So let me be the gardener. Let me take care of this. Let me make sure that this tree comes to fruitation. And so I think that's one of the ministries and that's one of the things that Jesus Christ gets involved with us about is, is as the gardener, it's his responsibility to make sure that uh, we are uh, producing fruit and to make sure that we are spiritually healthy and that we are growing and being nurtured the way that we should and doing the things that God would ask us to do and living in true righteousness. True righteousness is not just that which is imputed, but at us wanting to be right. It's a, it's a moral thing with you. I, I want to do what's right. I want to live what's right. Amen. And so again, I'm talking to you about the gardener is back. So he's back in the garden. Of course, the Bible talks about we are the planting of the Lord. And so it's important for us to understand that we are a part of that planting in the garden. We are a part of this thing. So now I want to, I want to talk to you about uh, some of the things because the gardener is back. Amen. Now, uh, Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 22, it, it, it's talking about, of course, uh, the wise man is, he's, he's dealing with several things there. That's, this is kind of where I was going to go originally with the Bible study tonight, and then I felt uh, to stay with this particular thought. Amen. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 2, and uh, let me find it here in uh, the last verse there, verse number 22. Now, he's talking about these paths, and this is what I was going to talk to us about. And he talks about justice and judgment and discretion and righteousness and all these things and finding uh, these paths of wisdom and walking down these paths of wisdom. So I really want to talk about paths tonight and paths of wisdom. But then he comes down through here, and he says, well, there are some other paths. And he starts talking about there's a – there are those in verse 13 of chapter 2 of Proverbs who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness. So in other words, uh, yeah, there are those that have been on this path, but they choose to go down another path. They leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness. Amen. So they choose to go with people that are, uh, one translation says, that are double-tongued, that they, they're they lying and they're not. Of course, now we're back to the garden. We're back to the serpent. Amen. Uh, double-tongued is what one of them says. Two-faced is what another one says. And so you choose to listen to them and to go down the path. They come with cunning craftiness. He said, they rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths. They're evil. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger with flat earth with her words. Amen. Uh, I, jokingly, I, I, I told him here a while back, when we look at these verses, I told him, I said, my text tonight may be evil men and loose women, because this is one of the things that the Bible, when it talks about this strange woman, one of the words that's given there is loose, means immoral. And so here it is, he's talking about this immoral woman. Now watch what she does, which forsaketh the God of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. In other words, she's married. She was married in her youth. This is the covenant that she made before God, with God, and taking her husband. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. Now notice what he says. The upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. Now, I've looked at these verses, and I've wondered, you know, if you go to this this adulterous woman, and she flatters you with her words, and you go down the path with her, then he says, you've gone in her, her house inclineth unto death, and her paths lead unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Now, you know, some say, what does that mean? An adulterous person is, is spiritually dead. They can never be recovered or whatever. Actually, it's talking about the community. 
if you go down this path, then you're going to lose life in the community. You're going to, lead a, uh, you're going to lose a dwelling place in the community. And to be honest with you, the community can be about your family. It can be about your home. It can be about even an organization and so on and so forth. So we have to be careful. And this is what the wise man is telling, and he's trying to give instructions here. But now notice he said, verse 21, for the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. So I, I want to make sure that I'm on this pr proper path, the way of truth. I want to make sure that I get into the right land, and I want to remain there. I want to dwell there. And I, it's important for me to be the planting of the Lord in the garden of God and for me to remain there, not just to go there, but for me to remain there. The next thing is, he said, but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. And when you look at that, it shall be rooted out. It actually means just as if someone pulls out weeds from a garden. So God looks at his planting. He sees this here as like a weed that's coming up because of the way that it's gone. It's not remaining upright or in righteousness, walking in wisdom. And so what he says is, is I'm going to root it out. It's the responsibility of Jesus Christ as the gardener to make sure that he protects and he guards. You'll remember uh, one of the parables that Jesus gave is about the planting and men come in and they sowed tares among the wheat. And he said, okay, just wait till it's harvest time. Let it grow up together, but at harvest time, there's going to be a separation. I'm going to separate the wheat from the tares. So God has always had his own way of separating. He's had his own way of pulling weeds out of the garden. He doesn't let you pull the weeds out of the garden. He doesn't give you the right to decide who gets pulled out of the garden or not, but that is the responsibility of the gardener of the gardener. Amen. So we watch all this. Now, uh, where, where I really want to kind of go is, is when we were, was on a zoom meeting with some of the men and the other day, and after it was over, we got talking about some of this and how that I was talking to them and I'm getting ready to do a little, another little Facebook deal, a little quick clip about this stuff and all. And what I was talking about is sharper or leaner. And I was talking about how I've been teaching about the, uh, the sharpening of the Lord. God, through this process, God wants to sharpen us so we can be a, a more precise instrument of harvest. But also, it talks about to lay aside every weight, so God wants us to come through this leaner. There's some things that God wants to cut from our lives. There's some things that God wants to prune. He wants us to lay it aside. He wants us to be leaner. He wants us to be more productive. And so we were talking about that, and then uh, one of the men said something about that the Lord had been dealing with him about the garden and on. I said, well, that's amazing because a few weeks ago I wrote down this little thought, the gardener is back. And I, so we were talking about that. After it was over, though, uh, one of the men, Brother Neil Royer, uh, sent me a little text and he said, hey, listen, uh, God's been talking to me about the same thing. And he said, uh, matter of fact, he's been talking to me about uh, the trimming of God, the pruning of God, and how that there's certain things that need to be uh, cut away. So he sent me this text, and I'm, I'm going to use this and hasten to a close here, but he sent me this text, and he said, these are three types of branches that need to be trimmed immediately. Number one is dead wood, which is sin. It needs to be trimmed. The gardener, you need to allow the gardener to work in your life to where he can trim out of your life the dead wood. There's no life flowing through it again. And I'm going to tell you something. When you start into sin, it's real easy. Let me, let me explain something to you. It's real easy to see people that are involved in sin and that are not living the life that they ought to. Even people who confess the Holy Ghost, people sitting on the pew, people uh, being used or whatever. Here's how you know. There's no life. There's no real spirit life that's there. It's just dead wood. There's no fruit being produced. If we stay connected, uh, the vine to the branches and all, it will produce fruit. And the main fruit, of course, is love. So if it's dead wood, Jesus said, if it's dead, then you know what you do? You cut it down, you cast it into the fire. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's the eternal lake of fire. I don't necessarily believe that, uh, meaning that men are going to cast you into the fire but basically, if you lose your connection to him, which is what sin does, sin separates. When the Bible talks about death, 
first death, the second death, it's not just talking about the decease of the body from the spirit and soul, but what it's talking about is, is you're separated from God and God is life. He's your life source. So people that start getting separated, there's two things that you can always watch. When they're being separated from God, then they become separated from the body and separated from each other. When that's happening, it's letting you know that there's something in their life that is causing them to be separated. They're not connected anymore. So it's very important, if I'm talking to you tonight, quit making excuses, quit blaming everybody else. You know what? Hell is going to be full of people that's made excuses, that blamed everybody else. But what you've got to do is you've got to allow the gardener into your life to make sure that he trims the dead wood, he trims the sin, he cuts the things that are dead in your life out so there can be life again. Amen. The second thing that he mentioned was is branches growing in the wrong direction which he, in, in the notes that he sent or the text that he sent was deception. So here we are. We got branches growing in the wrong, the wrong direction. It's deception. It's a, you know, should be moving and flowing with the rest of the branches in the body, but it's growing in an opposite direction. You know, deception is a funny thing. Amen. And if you see yourself at the body of Christ and the body's going one way and you're going another way and you think that you're on the right path or you think that you're the one that's correct and everybody else is wrong, then you need to wake up and understand that it can be a form of deception. Uh, Brother Merle Ewing taught us some things. He taught us that, you know, a man can deceive himself and he can recover. The enemy can deceive a man, and there is some recovery to that. But he said, but when God chooses to send a strong delusion, there is no recovery. So we have to be careful that we don't allow deception to lead us to the point to where we don't receive a love of the truth. And because of that, uh, this spirit of deception comes into our life. And Jesus said, if you don't receive uh, the spirit of truth, the love of the truth, uh, you'll, you'll be sent a strong delusion, believe a lie and be damned. So I want to make sure that I allow the gardener into my life. Number one, not just to cut out sin, but I want him to cut out any branch in my life or anything in my life that's growing in the wrong direction, going in the wrong direction, because if I'm not careful, uh, I become deceived. And uh, eventually, if, if I don't allow him to do that, then ultimately, he says, I will send a strong delusion. You'll believe a lie and be damned, which I definitely don't want to happen in my life. Amen. I want to be honest with the Word of God. I want to, I want to let the Word, I want truth, I want to have truth in my heart. The requirements of a true worshiper is spirited in truth. So a lot of people want to worship Him in spirit, which is the deepest part of you. It's even beyond the soul. But yet, the Bible talks about it's spirited in truth, which is honesty and sincerity. Amen. Uh, the Bible, Jesus said that Satan could not abide in the truth because there was no truth in him. So the psalmist, in his repentant prayer, he said, let truth be in my inward parts. I don't want it to be something false or deceptive or hypocrisy in me, lest it lead me down a path of death that I don't want to go down. But let truth be in my inward parts. You know, it doesn't matter how much you can be placed in truth if there's not truth in you, it's only a matter of time until you become deceived and you cannot abide in the truth. So you know what? I want to be truthful in my heart. I, I want to be sincere. I want to be honest before God. I don't want a branch growing in the wrong direction. And if it is, I want to have the ability to allow the Holy Ghost to cut it, to prune it, and to remove it to where the rest of my life can flourish and I can be making sure that I'm going in the right direction. The third thing that he mentioned, which I found amazing, was any limb rubbing against another. Now, he was telling, uh, Brother Royer was telling me, he said, man, these are the things that God's been dealing with me about. And you guys were talking about this in this meeting the other day, and he said, I just couldn't believe it. He said, I mean, God seems to be talking the same thing to a lot of us. And so he shared these things with me. Any limb rubbing against another, which would be an offense, which would be an offense. Again, three types of branches that need to be trimmed immediately. So if the gardener is actively working in your life, the first thing is dead wood, which is sin. The second one is branches growing in the wrong direction, which is deception. And the third thing is any limb rubbing against another, which is an offense. Amen. Uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, a root of bitterness, the Bible talks about a root of bitterness. And uh, these are weeds and these are things that chokes out other things, it chokes out life. 
And not only that, but when the root system of it, when you allow this to grow and when you allow this to take hold in your life, uh, the root system of it, it, it doesn't just affect you, but it defiles many. And so, you know, offenses must come. You know, you just might as well get ready for it. Offenses must come. Of course, woe to whom they come by. But if you're trying to live for God or live life, there's going to be offenses that come. People are going to offend you. There's going to be things that happen. But the key to this is, is to allow the gardener to do what he's designed to do, is to protect and to guard and to make sure that there's not anything growing in that garden that doesn't need to be growing, and especially in your heart. So it's wise for you to allow the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the Word of God to come into your life and to pull that weed out or to pull that branch off to cut it because you cannot afford to allow a fence to come into your life. You know, I talk a lot about this, and here's the thing. If you don't think I've had my opportunity to be offended and to carry these offenses, trust me, I've had several of them. But I've always made up my mind, number one, there's nobody that I know that I'd have any animosity about or against, even though it may be a wrong against me that I want to be lost over. So you know what? I've sinned against God. I've made my offenses against God. But in the Lord's Prayer, he says that you need to pray that God would forgive you your trespasses if you, as you forgive those that trespass against you. So you know what? You know, when you stand before God, you can't blame anybody else. And another thing is, is the Bible says that a righteous man is not easily offended. So you know what? If you're easily offended, there's something right, there's something that's not right in your life. And so you need to deal with it. Allow him, the gardener, to come and to prune and to cut. Allow him to prune the to prune the sin, to cut the sin, to pull that, and allow him to remove the deception and of course the offenses that would come. This is very, very important for us to allow it. So you know what? Again, the gardener is back. The last Adam is back in the garden, and he is there to protect it. He's there to guard it, and he's doing a great job. Amen. And the tree of life is there. Somebody said, well, what about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I believe it's there also. I, I, I don't want to get into another lesson or another sermon that I've preached through the years, but I do believe that you can go back, eat from the tree of life, and then go over here and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, somebody asked me what I really thought about the good and evil, and I said, well, and this is not a doctrine, and it's just a, a little theory that I've used. I said, well, to me, the Internet is a lot like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's good on it, and there's evil on it. Amen. And so it's there. It's, it's a part of where we're at. But it's the carnal man. When he learns to eat from both trees, it's the carnal man. And a carnal mind is not subject to anything or to any law. So we have to be careful that once we're allowed back to the tree of life, that we don't eat from the tree of life and then go over here and want to eat from the knowledge of good and evil and find ourselves in a carnal state, which ultimately, if I'm carnally minded, I'm dead. So I don't want to die again. I don't want to be expelled from the garden. I don't want to be cut out. I want to make sure that I'm eating from the tree of life and that the nutrients that's coming from there and the spirit life is flowing through me and I'm producing the fruit that I need to produce. Amen. It's amazing to me that once they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of it was their eyes are open. They seen how they were naked and ashamed and all these things. So I don't want that in my life. I want to make sure that I stay at the tree of life. I want to make sure that I allow the great gardener the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ, to work and to prune and to cut and to pull the weeds and to guard and to protect and to make sure that I don't allow anything in my heart, that you don't allow anything in your heart that you shouldn't allow. So allow him, the gardener is back. So allow him to do what he needs to do in his garden and his planting. And uh, again, uh, you're not the gardener, he is. And God didn't call you. Let me help some of you. I'm going to look straight at the camera and tell you God didn't call you to be a gardener. And he didn't call you to be the one to try to pull the weeds out of the garden. That's his responsibility. we got a lot of folks in the church, around the church. They want to assume the position of the gardener. And they want to rip the tares out and all the stuff and all. But you know what? He's the gardener. It's his garden. He will remove what he needs to remove. Because trust me. 
He's going to protect the garden. He's going to guard the garden. And the garden is going to produce the life that it's supposed to produce. Amen. So, all right. I've, I've said enough. I've, I've, I've kept you long enough. And, uh, you know, they're saying, you know, after 20 minutes, uh, people, especially if it's online, they get bored and they get off of something else. Well, hopefully it's not just boring and we can hold you a little longer than 20 minutes and keep you captivated by the Word of God. So, again, the gardener is back. Allow him to work in your life. And I think that's what's going on right now. You know, we don't like the isolation. We don't like all the stuff that we're doing right now allowed to be that's happening. You know, well, we're quarantined still in the state of California. We're still social distancing and all this stuff. But again, there's a couple of things. Number one is let him make you sharper. Let him put the edge to you. And when we come out of this, let's be a, a sharp harvesting instrument. And the other thing is let him cut away let him streamline, let him pull the weeds, let him trim off the things that need to be pulled or trimmed or whatever, and let us come out of this uh, as the tree that God wants or the fruit-bearing thing that God wants us to be. I think that's what this is really all about. So you know what? Enjoy your downtime. And it's I, I think personally, I could be wrong, but I think it's just about over, and God is going to give us a little extension and a little more on this space of grace. So again, he's trying to make a sharper and he's trying to make us leaner and he's asking us you know what let me cut and let me prune the things out of your life that don't need to be there all right so let the great harvester work where he needs to work and let the great gardener work where he needs to work amen all right god bless you don't forget our announcements thank you again for allowing me to be in your homes your living rooms your automobiles your cars and uh uh, all that good stuff. Amen. So God bless you is our prayer. Don't just hear this and let it go and just pass on, but allow the Spirit of God to really work and talk to you. And I think he will if you'll allow him to do that. Let the gardener work in the garden and let him do what he knows he can do. Amen. All right. God bless you is my prayer. And I pray that you will be uh, prosper and that the hand of God will rest upon your life in Jesus' name. Amen.